Go ahead, Gabo. Thank you. Okay. Again, good morning to everybody. So before I start, I wanted to ask you uh, how many of you have attended in the past the courses about uh, GPU programming or lectures, just to have an idea. Raise your hand, I mean, this is easier. Okay. I see three hands. Okay, not bad. I have, but uh, I cannot find the raise hand button now. <laughs> okay, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Thanks for letting us know. So I think you can raise your hand now. So let's start. So in this um, session, I will start with an uh, introduction um, about what uh, is this kind of architecture, I mean, in GPU. So you can have uh, some ideas also about the hardware because it's important when you try to um, to do a development on an architecture to have uh, at least basic understanding about how the architecture works, how are the pros and cons of uh, the architecture. So, um, okay, so let's see if this works, oops. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, that's good. Okay, so uh, um, uh, I will concentrate in how we uh, program GPUs, specifically uh, NVIDIA GPUs. And uh, NVIDIA back in 2006 introduced a platform which is called CUDA which is stands for uh, Compute Unified Device Architecture. And uh, uh, as you probably aware of, GPUs first introduced to the market um, for uh, graphics, for uh, gaming, for, um, uh, uh, for um, visualization and this kind of thing. So they uh, were not, uh, easily accessible to anybody who wanted to implement uh, something for general purpose. However, this platform now exposed the parallelism of the GPU. So we can um, uh, write simple codes. You don't need to use DirectX or uh, OpenGL or other uh, uh, graphic specific uh, libraries in order to communicate with uh, the GPUs after the introduction of this uh, platform. And the idea is that you have the GPU, you can use it for general paper, also for scientific applications or whatever other things you want. I mean, uh, uh, GPUs also used a lot in the past for uh, mining cryptocurrency. So they have a lot of uses if, if, um, if we can put it like this. Okay, so what we want to do is that we want to exploit this so many cores that these GPUs have in order to accelerate uh, either industrial applications that they may need a lot of power or um, uh, scientific applications. Okay, so CUDA comes also in C, C++, so it's a uh, uh, it builds extension on the C++, so it has an API. API is an application passing interface, and it has uh, also special kind of uh, syntax in order to be able to uh, implement a, a specific kind of kernels that we will see later that uh, can run on, um, on the GPU. That is also CUDA Fortran for those who um, like Fortran, but in this, in this um, presentation, I will focus in C++. I mean, the idea is uh, the same. It's just the syntax might be a bit different. Okay, and, uh, and it provides a way so we can implement uh, codes in a hybrid uh, way in the sense that you will write a code that um, some pieces in the code will be executed by the central processing unit, the CPU. 
and some others that are um, uh, compute intensive, let's say, can be offloaded to the GPU. And there, there are the API uh, functionality that I will discuss later that allow us to um, manage several things regarding the executions, uh, like uh, transferring data, uh, call a specific function for GPUs, etc. Okay, so in order to give you a feeling uh, how much um, uh, how much you can benefit from um, uh, how much you can benefit from using this kind of uh, architecture, uh, I took this picture from Nvidia's website. So it says, let's say that um, uh, we want to replace your uh, standard CPU server, okay, um, with uh, one NVIDIA GPU server that has four uh, GPUs. And uh, given uh, specific fields, how much we can accelerate your software. Okay, in the sense that let's come here, this is a, 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 a software related uh, geoscience, and it says that if you have a, a cluster with 54 uh, CPU nodes, each, each one with uh, two um, Xeon Gold uh, CPUs, I can replace it with one uh, GPU, with uh, sorry, one GPU server with four GPUs, and you will have uh, equal performance. Okay, and of course, this how much performance you get depends on the application because and on the problem, because uh, some problems may need half precision, others may need double precision, I, other may need mixed precision, less memory, more memory. So it depends a lot uh, on what kind of uh, a problem you have to solve, how much improvement you will get. In physics, uh, in my field, we get the 32, a factor of 32. We have also other fields like life science that you get a factor of 40. So, this is something that uh, tell us it's so important if you want to have compute intensive software to get use of, uh, of GPUs. Okay, so today we'll learn um, later how to write uh, small CUDA kernels uh, in C++ and also later I will discuss a bit how we can do it also uh, in Python, how we can move data from um, uh, the CPU memory to the GPU and how we can do synchronization, calculate time so we, we know uh, how much time we spend in what, uh, what part of the calculation. And uh, um, at the end, if I have enough time, I would like to discuss more advanced things like distributed computing. So how we can distribute the computation on different GPUs. Okay, it is good if you are a bit familiar with C, C++. However, if you have a general understanding of programming language, you can uh, understand the ideas what each command is doing. I will explain it anyway. For the part that involves um, uh, Python, it's good if you are a bit familiar with Python. You don't need experience with graphics. I will explain the basics so you can understand it. It will help if you have um, been familiar with parallel programming, so the similar concepts apply also here. Pixel graph is okay, we don't need that one. And um, if you want to write of your computer and you have an NVIDIA GPU, you will need the CUDA toolkit that provides the necessary compiler driver. But of course, for those that uh, they can connect to Cyclone, this already exists and, uh, and uh, we can use it from there. Okay, so the concept I will discuss uh, um, uh, now, it uh, involves what is heterogeneous computing. Uh, so what are the ideas of breaking this kind of calculation in CUDA blocks and CUDA threads? How we can index the threads that um, uh, give us access to uh, the various um, computational units of the GPU and also accessing different um, memory location, how we synchronize the threads, because as we said, this is a very parallel uh, 
unit, the idea of shared memory, the device memory, how we do asynchronous operations, how we overlap communication and computation, which is something uh, crucial to achieve a very good performance, and how we handle errors. Okay, so let's start now. Uh, first, let's understand the terminology that uh, is, is usually used in uh, heterogeneous computing. So we have a computer, let's say your laptop, it has a, a central processing unit, a CPU, and uh, the, um, uh, we call the CPU the host of this kind of heterogeneous application. Okay, because it uh, communicates with operating system, so and it can oversee the whole calculation. Um, uh, and uh, and um, the host memory is uh, the CPU memory. So because the CPU has its RAM, we will call it uh, the CPU memory. Now, on the other hand, we have the, um, uh, the GPU, the graphing processing unit, that we will call it device. And this GPU that you see here is specifically uh, um, a Volta architectural designed for high performance computing. And this uh, connection here is the PCI connection that connects it to the uh, motherboard. And it has its own memory. Inside this card, it has its own memory that we will call it GPU memory. Okay, so this is the first terminology that we need in order to proceed. So in order to understand a bit better how um, a HPC computer node looks like, I put here an image of uh, a computer node of the currently fastest supercomputer in the United States. It's from Summit, for those you may have heard about it. And this, this is one node, okay? And, um, and there is here the power supply a very strong power supply, it has below the motherboard. And those three uh, things that you see here are the GPUs. So those, they do not need any box, they directly connect to the, um, to the motherboard and they uh, have also a cooling system that you see here, these uh, pipes. Okay, they have also two CPUs, those are two CPUs, they have uh, many RAMs. So this is how in general this uh, node looks like. And of course you have connection to the node to other nodes. I will talk more about this later. Okay, so um, let's see how now a hybrid code of, uh, of CPU and GPU looks like. So usually at the beginning, you start with uh, a serial implementation of the code. So you have just one thread. And uh, by the way, if anytime you have a question, please um, unmute your microphone, interrupt me and ask your question. And um, uh, we have one thread that will be executed in one of the cores of your CPU. And usually you will initialize uh, the problem that you have. Uh, initialization means read some input uh, or some kind of configuration. And uh, you may do some pre-processing on, on the host, which is lightweight, and then transfer data to the device memory, to the GPU memory, as we said. And uh, the second part is that the, the CPU will um, make sure that the data have arrived to the GPU, and then calls a function that will be executed on the GPU. And during that function, the GPU will create a lot of threads, okay, that you see here. And all these threads, uh, and all these threads will be executed in parallel, okay? So in contrast to the CPU that you are, uh, um, execute one or two or three threads, here may execute many, many thousands of threads, okay? And um, this, you can imagine that the situation that you have many, many workers that work in parallel to finish a, a very um, um, intensive task. 
which uh, allows parallelization, of course. This is very important that the probe allows parallelization to finish it. When all those workers finish this, um, their task, they report back to the host that the computation is completed and maybe the host uh, copy back data. If you want to visualize it or store the outcome of the calculation, or maybe you call another kernel to do some other kind of calculation. But this is uh, the general way that uh, this hybrid uh, uh, um, programming scheme works. Okay, so let's go a bit deeper to understand the, the, the two architecture. We said we have the central processes unit, which is different compared to the GPU in the several sense. For example, the CPU can handle an operating system, the GPU cannot. Okay, so let's say the GPU is a bit dummy, but uh, it has a lot of computational power. I mean, there are the, the cores that the GPU has are relatively simple, but so many. Okay, so the CPU has low computational density. This is what I mentioned now. But of course, it has a very complex control unit to have to do logical um, uh, calculation and control and operating system. And if, <coughs> sorry, and it has also large caches. So it has uh, many megabytes of caches, different levels, level one, level two, level three, in order to um, cache important um, data that might be used uh, in the near future to um, improve performance. Um, but uh, it, and it also has higher clock speed, uh, uh, several gigahertz of, um, of clock speed. And the registers that it has is relatively small. So registers are those that are closest to the computational uh, units that hold uh, information about the data. And uh, those ranges are very few and very expensive. Uh, and, the, and the CPU does not have many. On the other hand, it has a lot of memory. We have now uh, CPU nodes that uh, may go up to one terabyte of, of, uh, of RAM, for example. So on the other hand, the GPU, as we said, it's very high computational density. It has um, a lot of transistor, much more than the CPU. And it, it has been constructed in a way to provide a high throughput in the sense that the data should go very fast from the um, uh, device memory to the for beam process. And can perform, of course, because to the, it's parallel number computation are per memory access. And the register are large, uh, but of course, are distributed as we will see later in many uh, multiprocessors. And the control units are relatively simple. So it's, uh, the GPU really depends on the CPU to, to do uh, operations. Okay, just for historical reason, I wanted to show this, um, uh, this plot that shows the, uh, the roadmap, uh, how the, uh, uh, the HPC graphics have been developed uh, over time. So as I said, but about 2006, NVIDIA introduced CUDA. And after the introduction of CUDA, that scientists were able uh, to use uh, this kind of architecture, the demand has increased for scientists to, to, to have um, GPU, which are specialized for, for high performance computing. For example, um, back then, the GPUs couldn't do many double precision calculation. But there are scientific um, problems that uh, for, the, for those are it's very critical. So slowly, slowly they, they have developed cards in the um, family which is called Tesla. By the way, also the architecture in 2008 called Tesla, but the whole family of HPC card is called Tesla. 
Okay, and then we had uh, Fermin in 2010. So every year you can see more or less NVIDIA has uh, a new architecture. So in 2008, uh, they have uh, Volta and this shows the, also the exponential increase, increase in performance for single precision multi multi multiplication per watt. Okay, and this shows that it grows exponentially. By the way, the Volta is the architecture that Cyclo has. I will discuss about it later. And now the the um, the latest one in uh, um, um, the latest architecture that Nvidia has it's uh, Ampere. It's uh, already in the market for more than a year, and the. Um, and the supercomputer, uh, the, the number one supercomputer in Europe is equipped with an uh, Ampere and graphics card. Okay, so it just to um, give you an idea how the different architectures evolve. So I compare here the previous architectural Volta with the newest one, Ampere, in order to discuss a bit um, uh, the different feature characteristics and improvements that uh, uh, these uh, this, uh, GPUs have. So a very important component of a GPU is that, as I said, it's a parallel unit. And if you compare it to the CPU, the CPU has uh, maybe eight, 16, 32 CPUs. On the other hand, then GPU is a supercomputer on its own in the sense that in this small graphic card that I showed you before, it uh, uh, built in inside, there are many multiprocessors, okay? And for example, the Volta architecture had 80 uh, streaming multiprocessors, and this has increased in the latest architecture, which is in the pair, it has in, increased to 108. Okay, and each of those streaming multiprocessors has cores, okay? And there are cores that are capable of doing single precision arithmetics, also those that they can do double precision arithmetics. For example, single precision, we have um, um, both in Volta and Ampere 64 cores. Okay, so if you multiply the two, you can get how many cores you have per GPU. For example, uh, on a pair, we reach the astonishing number 7,000 cores per GPU. Okay, but as I said, those cores are not as fast and, are, and as uh, sophisticated as the CPU cores, but there are, are many. Uh, they have uh, less on um, for double precision, so this is uh, they have half, okay. Uh, the the clock the clock speed is uh, much lower compared to um, a CPU core, as you can see. However, the astonishing um, uh, result in this table is how much performance those GPU can get, and the GPUs can also do uh, half precision. For example, for those interested in uh, machine learning applications, the GPUs uh, have this half precision that they can uh, benefit a lot um, um, in their application. And uh, it can reach up to 78 um, teraflop per second. Okay, and this decrease, of course, as we go to higher precision, for instance, if we are interested for double precision, this give us 10 teraflop per second. And other important aspect of a GPU is how fast it can um, um, take the data from the device memory to, to its compute units. Okay, and this reach about one terabyte per second. Uh, this is 1.5 for the Tesla architecture. However, the device memory, it's very limited. As I say, CPU may have now up to one terabyte of, uh, of run on, a hyper, on an HPC node. However, uh, a GPU uh, has um, of the order of a few tens of gigabytes. So in the Volta architecture, uh, is 16 or 32 gigabytes. For instance, 
those that will have on Cyclone, they have 30, 32 gigabyte each. However, now the Tesla have up to 40. It's not much. So you have to be careful how um, uh, you use it. Okay, now let's go in a, even deeper now. We said that the GPUs are, um, are a supercomputer by their own and they have streaming multiprocess. And, the, and this is um, a cartoon of how a streaming <coughs> multiprocessor looks like. So they have, um, so when you compile your application and um, transform it to information that the machine can process, we call this uh, information extraction. And those extractions from the software that you compile should go to the streaming multiprocess. So the streaming multiprocessor has the extraction buffer to, uh, to um, uh, store this information, the extraction, and it has also a specialized unit that is called instruction cache to, for uh, instructions that are repeated. So um, it can access this instruction very fast. And it has, uh, yeah, the warp scheduler, I will uh, discuss it uh, um, uh, a lot later. So it allows you to schedule which of the um, part of the calculation will be active or inactive in order to high latency of uh, transferring data um, uh, to the execution units. So I, you mean that, I mean there is a latency and this uh, scheduler uh, can hide it. They, we have the dispatch units that are uh, units that uh, are um, responsible for uh, feeding the, the registers with uh, the data. And the register files are the closest in the compute unit. So we uh, reach to the point where we uh, have the compute units in both single precision. There are also the double precision units shown here with uh, yellow. And we have um, uh, units like us uh, doing special functions. So special functions usually means uh, to do a square root or the sine or cos. So those units have been uh, specialized so to do this kind of operation very fast because are relatively common in scientific application. And uh, we have uh, some remnants from the um, time that GPUs was uh, used for graphics related to texture. Okay, those are very advanced uh, feature, I will not go into so much detail. But of course we have the shared memory that will, uh, as I explained later, allow us to share information um, between the compute units of a, a streaming multiprocess. Okay, do you have any question up to now about the introductory stuff? Okay, this is not the case, I will proceed. So um, as briefly said, the fastest supercomputer in the United States now is Summit. By the way, this is not the fastest in the, York, in the work. The fastest in the York is Fukago in Japan. Uh, so this one in the United States uh, can reach up to 150 petaflop performance using a specific um, uh, library. And it's equipped with um, about 4,600 uh, uh, nodes. And each of the nodes, okay, on this supercomputer that you see here, by the way, a node is just one cell that you see here in this cabinet and it has men, okay? And each one of those nodes has uh, IBM uh, CPUs power nine that uh, have 512 gigabyte of RAM. And each of those nodes that I showed before, it has these six uh, GPUs. These are, are Volt architecture, like the one that we have on, on Cyclone. However, those, they have less uh, memory. So each one has 16 gigabyte. And in order to give you an idea how much um, electricity demanding this uh, supercomputer is so uh, uh, its consumption goes up to the 13 uh, megawatt 
and its cost just to, to build this machine, it costs many hundreds of millions of dollars. Of course, this is uh, not so much for the United States, but this gives you an idea that uh, these, um, uh, these machines uh, really cost a lot. You have to interconnect all the loads, you have to put a cooling system, uh, etc. Okay, but now let's go to what we have in Cyprus. Uh, so considering that Cyprus is how many times smaller? It's about uh, three, 300 times smaller than uh, uh, US, I think. Um, we have a machine here that it, uh, it's uh, 0.6 petaflops. So remember the um, uh, on uh, on summit it was 100 about 150, so this is 0.6, which is reasonable given the size of Cyprus, and the cyclone has um, both partition. It has both a CPU partition, which is equipped um, uh, only with uh, with CPUs, and we have also the GPU uh, partition, which is the, uh, the partition that we will concentrate on has 16 uh, GPU nodes, and each one um, um, has uh, four, four GPUs, and the GPU now have 13 uh, gigabyte. Okay, we will do some tests uh, there later. Hey, uh, you know, can I ask? Yes. When you say 0.6 petaflops performance, you mean yes. when you use all the nodes, right? Yeah, this comes um, from the whole machine. Okay. Is 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 the performance given all the all the nodes that it has? Okay, so per node, uh, would we be? Uh, what's the comparison with uh, Summit? The, the performance. So, so if do if you know? want to, if you want to do it per node. Um, uh, you have to distinguish between the CPU and the GPU nodes, of course. Because uh, the CPU, they do not have any GPUs, which uh, most of the computational power comes. But briefly sp speaking, if you talk about the peak performance, um, it has uh, a GPU node has uh, four GPUs. And if you count them in double uh, precision performance, we said the Volta, where I put it, the Volta has about eight teraflops, so you can do eight times four, plus something from the CPUs, something more from the CPUs. But most comes from those GPUs. Okay, and uh, regarding to how you compare it to the uh, Summit, Summit has again the Volta, it has the same performance, but it times six. Okay, so per node, it's not a big difference, but it has many GPUs not compared to Cyclone. Okay, okay. I, th Thank I think I have uh, questions in this chat. Uh, in the, um, so how busy is the Cyclone cluster usually? Okay, ah, Stegios already replied. So um, yeah, it's usually- Yes, thanks Kiriakos. Uh, yeah, so Cyclone is, uh, is usually um, in the past was not so very busy until we have the production runs, but now with the production run, it's, um, it's, uh, usually, um, it's usually busy. So, and because it has to serve many uh, users, you need to take this into account. Okay, does this ask you a question, Christo? Uh, yes, I was just a, a side question. Do we have to be part of the consortium in order to, to be able to obtain the runtime on, on the cluster? No, but Stejo can say more about that. Stejo? Um, Christo, no, not really. Um, you can get preparatory access uh, easily uh, on Cyclone where you get a bit of time to port your code or scale your code or develop your code. For large amounts of uh, time, then you need a project, a uh, scientific project, 
where you outline your scientific goals and uh, the technical suitability of your project to uh, use uh, large amounts of resources and nodes. For, forgive me for intruding again into the presentation. Uh, Giria was just uh, really quick. In the past, uh, I think the Cyprus Institute well was really um, uh, was uh, reading um, emails if we're interested in running um, in running applications or over the cluster. But um, I think that there was a limited amount of uh, uh, availability. Is, is this better now? And um, do you think that uh, it's actually more readily available for? Uh, for others uh, to use it, uh, for example, learning electromagnetic simulations and all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's it. You can use it definitely. I mean, but the question is, if 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 I want to access a node now and it uh, other users use it, you have to wait a bit. But in general, in a year, you can have a lot of resources if you um, get the production run, the production proposal. How many stage you? Is you can get up to half a million or yeah. more, or 50,000 GPU hours or more. But that's for very big projects, Christo. You have to be ready for it. So first, uh, people are advised to submit a preparatory access application, which is a very simple process. And there's not much that details that are needed. And then once you're comfortable with your code uh, to be able to run uh, large scale on the system, then you submit a production access application. Yeah, I think we can discuss more about it later in the, in the break if you want. Agreed. Uh, sorry, guys. Okay, no problem. So yeah, I was um, um, the point where I wanted to introduce uh, the concept of what are the CUDA blocks and CUDA threads, because as we said, we need to find a way to communicate with this um, uh, uh, architecture. Okay, we remember again that this is a parallel architecture, so we need an abstraction, a programming abstraction, in order to put this to work. And this abstraction go, goes like this. Let's say we have a grid, okay? It can be either one dimensional, two dimensional, or three dimensional, depending on your needs. And inside in this grid, there are what we call blocks. In those blocks reside the threads. Okay, and also the blocks can have up to three dimensions depending on your needs. And this is what you see here. The block uh, here it make it two dimensional in order to be able to visualize it. And uh, each block can have um, uh, um, uh, threads. And uh, the kernel that you write in order to um, do your calculation, it will take into account that we want to communicate with this machine in a way that go from a hierarchy, from a grid, which is higher in the hierarchy, to threads, which are um, lower in the hierarchy. Okay, and then let's go to uh, understand how inside in this block we can have the threads and, and understand how they are function. So the thread, it's, it's a piece of uh, instruction to be executed somewhere. And this somewhere, of course, is it's, um, uh, um, a core. Okay, and this thread, it should be able to access information that uh, uh, about the data that um, exists on the registers. As we said, the closest and more expensive to the compute unit. And each of these threads, it uh, has its own lo local memory. Okay, it, it means that it will process information and it will store it in this local memory that is not directly accessible to other threads. It's only known to the thread that uh, has produced and stored the information in its own local memory. However, uh, um, there could be communication between the different threads uh, in the same block only, okay? So for instance, we have the shared memory that a thread can take the information from its own local memory, put it in the shared memory, 
and this shared memory is visible to all the threads inside a CUDA block. However, different threads on uh, different blocks, for instance, if you we take this block and you put information in this shared memory, this cannot be shared directly with a, th uh, with a thread uh, in this block. Okay, and, um, um, and uh, each block, each of these block that we create here can run on one streaming multiprocessor. Okay, we cannot share uh, um, blocks between two um, different streaming multiprocessors. And this is the idea that you need to allow up to any degree uh, information to be uh, processed in parallel to uh, take advantage of the parallel nature of a GPU. However, you need to up to any degree to be able to coordinate and share information. And this happens mostly on the level within a CUDA block. We will see examples later. And of course, we have the global memory. This is what I call before device memory. It's the same. And this is the slowest one. It's very slow. So you may use it to, um, uh, uh, to transfer data when you start the calculation on the, uh, on the registers. And you may, under some circumstances, circumstances communicate information between different blocks within this global memory, but this is very slow. So we should be careful and don't overdo it. And of course we have other kinds of, of special kind of memory that, okay, it's not so important for now to discuss. Okay, another uh, important aspect of the GPUs is that because they evolve over time, okay, and the, um, and they put more and more features on the GPUs, you need to know the compute capability of, if, of um, each of the uh, architecture that uh, you may use. Because given on the architecture and its compute capability, you may have different performance um, if conditions in your uh, code to activate and deactivate based on the architecture that is available on different machine because you may run your application of Cyclone that has uh, the V100, the Volta architecture. Um, and you want to also use the same application on a computer that has the Ampere architecture. So you need to be aware about the capability that it has because this may change some of the feature. For example, the, the compute capability that we will compile uh, the code on Cyclone, it's, 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 it's seven and on a pair it's eight. And another um, feature to remember, it's uh, how many threads we can group together that they simultaneously execute instructions as they come to the CPU. This is what we call warp. Warp is this group that we group our threads to execute simultaneously instructions. So we know that are, are fully synchronized if they execute the simultaneously the same. And it has a change for a long time. It's always 32 threads that NVIDIA chose. And you can have a maximum number of warps that uh, uh, can exist on a streaming multiprocessor that are 64. And of course, how many threads you can have a streaming multiprocessor. So you have this limitation that you always need to take into account. Otherwise, your compiler May, com may complain or during runtime, if this is inefficient, it will throw you an error. And uh, since there are this kind of, uh, of limitation, we need to take them into account for performance reasons. For example, the registers, as I said, the registers are super fast to um, uh, offload data to the compute unit, but they are limited per block. And if you use all of them, you may not have to create another block. And if you cannot have another block to be run in parallel on a stream multiprocessor, you degrade the performance. And um, we have also the maximum number per thread, and we have also other restrictions, like for instance, the shared memory per streaming multiprocessor is very limited. It's 96 kilobytes only. Because it's, it's, it's expensive, it's small. It has increased, of course, in Tesla, 
but still it's limiting the streaming multiprocessor. Okay, so I will say a few more things later about uh, the meaning of a warp and the shared memory. So don't worry if you don't understand all these details by now. Okay, so let's go to more details about now how we can have um, how we can implement the code. So we can we have an overview now how the GPU is structured and uh, the idea of parallelism uh, to accelerate calculation. But let's go now to the more practical things. So in order, of course, to compile um, uh, a code that you have developed, and if you have uh, written it in a to, um, in a way that uh, is meant to be run on a GPU, you need a special kind of compiler uh, to compile it. For instance, um, standard compilers that uh, use for, for um, codes that are only for CPU can be an Intel compiler and GNU compiler, and, um, and there are more like Craig compiler. Um, now, for those that are specialized for NVIDIA GPUs, we have the NVCC compiler. This is how it's called. NV stands for NVIDIA, of course. And this NVIDIA compiler actually has a, a, a host compiler. This host compiler takes um, responsibility of the pieces of the code um, that are meant to run on the CPU. And the host compiler can be a standard GCC compiler. However, when you have a kernel specialized to run on a GPU, this, the, the NVIDIA compiler would take care to compile that piece of code. Okay, and um, in order to be able to have this hybrid kind of code, we, not, we need to have keywords to distinguish between uh, functionality that is meant to be um, for run or GPU or CPU, okay? And now we have uh, some keywords that I'll explain now. So functions that are, um, are called from the host and executed of the device, this is the most usual thing that uh, one can have on a hybrid code, they need to take the keyword global, okay? So instead, in front of the function definition, I will show later example, we need to have the keyword global. But of course, we can have also other cases. For instance, imagine that you are uh, inside of such a function that is executed on, on a device, and you want to have sub functions so that you want a device to call a function like this and execute it on the device. So such function, um, uh, take uh, the keyword device. And we have also um, uh, the case that you have a function that a, uh, the, the host will call it and be executed on the host. Those take the keyword host. Of course, if you um, don't put such a keyword, implicitly meant to be the standard case. But if you, go, if you have a function, for example, that you want it to be compiled in both um, architecture, you can put both. You can put, for instance, host device. And this will be executed in both uh, architecture. Now, this kind of, um, of functions, the one that I put the keyword global, uh, they take special kind of arguments because as we said, we have this abstraction of, um, um, of um, CUDA blocks and CUDA threads that I briefly discussed previously. So you need to provide information how many of these CUDA blocks you want to create and how many of these CUDA threads. And this will be passed through this triple uh, arrow notation. Again, I will show examples later. Okay, now um, let's go to, 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 have, to have a look to some codes. I have prepared um, a Git repository for uh, the needs of this training event. But first we need to make sure that you are able 
to, um, to have access to Cyclone and uh, download the, um, the repository that we will use for the training. So if you do not, um, uh, if you have issues to be able to connect to, to Cyclone, um, we will uh, um, have someone for the HPC facility who can uh, assist. But first, uh, raise your hand those who, who don't uh, have access to Cyclone, that for some reason have a problem. Okay, I do not see any hand raised. So this means that you all have access, hopefully. Okay, so this is the repository and in order to download the repository, we need the git, we need the, the, the git command. And then you say git clone and you put, oops, and you put um, um, the location of the repository. Is it? Could you please copy and paste it in the chat? Sure. Okay, so now uh, it's in the chat. I don't know if I can put it also in the Slack. I think everybody should have access to it. And then you are on the Cyclone, you execute this command git clone and it will uh, copy this to your uh, home directory. Kiriago. Yes. Is Marius. I don't have uh, access to Cyclone. I don't have an account. I don't know if one was created for me when I registered with for the course. When you register to the course, how you send information to the HPC facility um, about uh, an SSH key and this kind of thing? Oh, no, I haven't. You haven't because they need this information in order to. Um, uh, I have to send. Uh, yeah, send the send the, send them this information. George or Thekla. Uh, yeah, you can send this to Thekla or Mina. So I don't know who who um, who else is processing this. Yeah, but they, they should be able to create an account with that. Okay, so they they just want my public key. Yeah. Uh, and also your email, I think. And your okay. name. All right. Then. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Marie. So, is there anybody else with issues to download the repository? Okay. So, the now I have also here on the left another window in order to to be able to simultaneously go through the, the slides and see the exercises. So can you see also the left um, uh, window? Are both visible, the slides and the left window? Okay, excellent. So in this repository, I have several, uh, I prepared several exercises for this event. And uh, we will go through them and um, and explain all the details. However, if you want to compile uh, the executable, I have a script here, this compile.sh uh, script that you can um, execute. It will load the appropriate modules that you need. And then, go through all the exercises and inside we'll compile them. Of course, we can do it uh, uh, step by step later. This is just to uh, let you know um, about the files that you can see here. And um, we can start with the first example, the, the one that is called ex0. Okay, so um, I don't know if, uh, if you are not familiar with this uh, Linux environment, it's good if, if you at least uh, get familiar with few of the commands that are very useful, like change directory, 
list the content of the director and this kind of things in order to be able to um, follow uh, what I will like, uh, explain. Um, okay, so here you can see uh, a file. This is uh, uh, our first example. And here it's uh, an, um, a script, a very simple one that uh, will allow us to compile this executor. So if you didn't want to write a script in order to be able to compile uh, uh, such uh, a file, you need this, for, uh, this command. Let me explain it a bit. We said that if we have a code that has um, uh, pieces that need access to a GPU, we need then VCC in compiler. And then we have this option, minus arc, that we specify for which architecture we want to compile. Okay, because in principle, the NVCC um, may compile for different GPUs. Imagine that you have uh, one node that has two different GPUs that they have two different architectures. So you may want to compile your code in different architectures and rather than different one on, on each in GPU. I mean, usually this is not the case on a supercomputer. They, uh, most of the cases they have uh, same uh, um, architecture on the GPU. But okay, anyway, this says that uh, my uh, compute compatibility is seven, as I told you before for the Volta. And this, for example, is the optimization level that the compiler uh, will have. I just put the highest one. And then your source code, and then minus O, you are, um, you are output. Okay, for example, you can run and compile it like this, or you can execute the compile.sh executable. This will do the same thing. Okay, now, if, if you want to run this one, let me run it so you can see this, and then we can explain what it is inside. You say dot slash and you are executable, And uh, yes, it just replied to me uh, the, the, um, some information about what kind of uh, GPUs I have. Now, tell me. Sorry, okay. Can I interrupt? Sorry, this is Timos. Yes, uh, Timos. Should, should we load some module like NVCC? Because. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Them. You are completely right. So here in compiler, you can see the module that you can load. You can. Um, either run this uh, uh, script that compiles or then automatically loads them or go through all of them and, and copy paste module load this one, uh, module load this one. Of course, if you, the important one is this for NVCC compiler, the GCC CUDA. Okay, this we may need later, but the important one is this one. Okay, you see it on my screen. I do, yeah, and you can open the file, the compile all, but I don't want to compile all, so I just copy paste. Yeah, yeah, for and, example, and, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so now if you write in VCC, for instance, which, which means which location it is, it would tell you that in VCC exists in this location on, on Cyclone, okay? So, and now you should be able to execute the command that I, um, that I said before, uh, this one, and compile it. So if you try, oh, by the way, now it's already 11. That's what I was uh, going to say. So we can use a bit yeah. more time if you want, Iago. Uh, if you want uh, to explain something quickly and we can try the... Yeah, I want to say a few, few words and then we have a break. Okay. Reconvene in half one hour. So what I wanted to say that try to compile it, uh, but the issue is that if you try to execute that on the on the, on the front end, there is no GPU on the front end. Okay. So in order for this executable to have a meaning, you need to access a GPU node that we have. Um, we have a location for um, this training event, some GPU nodes. So you can 
access to them and try to execute the executable and, uh, um, and see the outcome of the executable. Okay, I can, um, I will write few, few uh, commands on the Slack so you can uh, have a look. But I think now we can uh, have a break. Okay, and um, meet at uh, half past uh, 11. Okay. okay, thank you, Diriago. Thank you, everyone. Uh, let's meet again in uh, 25 minutes or so. Please be on time and uh, watch out on Slack for anything that Diriago posts. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay.